Okay, welcome back um, to our second hour of um, introduction to counseling where we're doing our topic on the Christian counselor. Uh, we left off uh, uh, in our last class on uh, talking about certain elements of a Christian counselor. And uh, yeah, I think Samuel had two questions. Samuel, if you're there, it would be great if you can uh, bring about your questions. Yes, 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 thank yes, you, Samuel. Pastor. Yeah. Uh, so, Pastor, uh, one question, the first question was around a uh, formal uh, secular training as a counselor or, or even psychology. Um, and uh, how much would that benefit or be essential uh, you know, to a Christian counselor? Like, like the, the way character is formed, the way our, I don't know, neurons or our brain circuitry work and things like that. I, I, I don't know what to what uh, are the topics under the formal education, but uh, so someone, uh, I mean, I, I can see a lot of value uh, for a Christian counselor going with the secular understanding of the human uh, brain and also equipped with the scripture and prayer and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So I can, that, I can see that. And, um, and also maybe, a little bit of danger of not having the secular knowledge. I, I don't know if there is a danger of not having the secular background and just going in as a, a counselor and, and, and trying to counsel someone uh, who is clinically uh, under depression uh, or, you know, like, I, I, I don't know when I, when, when I, so again, I think maybe one question is the difference between a psychiatrist and a counselor probably so it borders to that as well. Like, for example, I, I can imagine a psychiatrist, a Christian psychiatrist, to be able to counsel as well as prescribe certain drugs, whereas uh, someone not trained in the medical field might just be less, like, does it limit? So, so the first question was around how much of, um, there's definitely benefit, but what are, is, there, is there a limitation? Are, are we a little disabled uh, as counselors who, would take up counseling, but without the proper uh, medical or secular knowledge. Um, and, and if there is a short version of uh, getting equipped with that, uh, how, what's like the best way of going about it? Uh, or even in this course, do, do we have scope of learning a little bit about uh, the human brain or, or anything you know, at a very basic uh, fundamental level? Okay, so that you had one more question too, Samuel? Yes. Uh, the other question is, um, I said that the, this is something that um, I keep thinking of. So, uh, even as you were sharing that, you know, when when we when we experience certain things, when uh, life brings certain circumstances uh, to us, we learn so much from it. And sometimes it's also we learn, uh, you know, by making the wrong choices. You know, we we, we theoretically we understand a few things, but but we disobey and we go and then we learn and then we realize like oh, okay you know and and it brings a new revelation and then we, okay i'm never gonna do this now or i'm, I'm uh, so we make certain resolutions so th so there is definitely a lot of value to learn by experience but but um to learn from others experience or to learn from counsel uh is i feel uh uh I mean, I feel it saves time, saves a lot of heartache, uh, saves a lot of energy, money, like a lot of resources is saved if I can just learn from others. Like, um, you know, for example, let's say uh, anything, drug addiction or adultery, you know, th these topics are often preached uh, uh, and talked about. So at a theoretical level, a person might understand, okay, adultery is bad, uh, an illicit relationship is bad. Uh, but there are chances that the person might get into it, get into uh, an illicit relationship, and then, uh, and then find himself or herself in, in deep waters and then somehow by the grace of God come out of it and then understand that, you know, this is... But if the person would have learned that, not just theoretically but would have learned it enough not to fall into that trap rather than having to experience it and then realize you know uh, 
that. So, so this 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 art of learning from others' experience or learning by counsel um, is is saves time, saves energy, is, is more beneficial. However, it's uh, it's uh, compared to learning by experience. You know, it's it's like if if all of us learned with counsel or learned. Um, uh, by listening to others' experiences, then probably you know it, we wouldn't, we would, yeah, we would avoid so much of heartache and so much. So, so now as, as someone who is trying to teach someone from counsel or like you know, I I experience this, so I'm, I'm telling you from experience that this is bad or this is not the right way or right decision. But for a counselee who is learning. Uh, you know, she might he or she might understand it, uh, but wh whether she's like completely equipped, uh, not to, so. So I'm I'm struggling with the other aspect. The, the bigger thing is, you know, mm -hmm. how how is learning from others' experience? Uh, how how do we learn from others' experience uh, in a way where you know we are wiser, and at the same time, how do we teach others in such a way that we are able to impart that knowledge where uh, you know while learning by experience may be the best, I mean, maybe the most effective way, but generally not, not in terms of um, avoiding so much of pain and trouble. So these were the two broad questions. Two questions. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll try and uh, uh, answer this as best as possible. So the first one where um, uh, I think Samuel asked about, uh, uh, you know, the importance of secular uh, knowledge or to know the signs of psychology, behavioral signs of, um, for a Christian counselor to function as efficiently and effectively as possible. And I think there is, there is a, a, a lot of wisdom in, in uh, psychology and in that kind of a science. Um, and I would recommend that uh, any of you who are wanting to pursue in, um, counseling should take certain short-term courses um, in you know in the field of counseling psychology for you to be able to get a good wraparound and understanding of how it functions I'll give you a very simple example like and I think that's one of the examples that even Samuel bought about is let's say someone who comes to you with clinical depression we always may think clinical depression has its root either in in a spiritual problem or it has a, 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 a its root in an emotional problem but when you look at depression in itself you know depression can be caused because of a thyroid issue you know physical thyroid issue it can be caused because of certain structural changes in the brain it can be caused because of age related issues so there are certain medical uh, physiological conditions that can cause certain psychological emotional disturbances so someone who does not approach a person or a or a problem holistically can can be in the risk of not helping effectively okay so and uh, so that's one uh, one part of it the other part is even understanding personalities of people we're all um, uh, we're all very different and unique in the way that we express our temperaments and uh, psychology really helps us to understand some um, uh, uh, high points of certain personalities, low points of certain personalities, and how that interacts with their their spiritual experience. Okay, like for example, you know, you would have seen people who are extroverts. Um, you know, can actually go and and talk to many people about about God and Christ and all of that, but people who are more you know, withdrawn and um, more more within themselves may find it something uh, uh, some a, a difficult thing, right? So just being able to understand this aspect really helps as to how we develop different strategies and how people could evangelize and and so what I'm saying is, you know, 
uh, science, psychological science really helps to build a good overview about um, um, about behavior, about the mind, about the brain, about emotions, about perception, very many things. And and I think um, that is necessary. That is something, if you are pursuing this as a career or want to pursue this as a really strong ministry, doing that can actually help build your repertoire of skills. Okay. Now, uh, the differences, but what, what we were talking about is that, so yeah, there are differences between a psychiatrist and a psychologist. Yes, there are those differences. Now, a psychiatrist is more medically um, taught, that which means they, they go through medical school, as well as they do have certain um, certain bits of their education with regard to psychology and counseling. Whereas a psychologist does not go to medical school, they work a lot more in the interactions of behavior and relationships and personality. So th that is one of the basic difference. So to, to, be, to be able to have a strong background in psychological science and also be deeply grounded in the word, I think is like a double weapon okay it 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 really it really really helps uh, because you you are able to see it at some part from a human uh, mind perspective but there are some conditions that you look at it spiritually as well so to have that discernment and i i think it is important to have a good balance of a of a secular knowledge of it as well as a biblical uh, understanding of it. Okay, the second question of uh, yours, you said uh, learning by counsel uh, rather than learning by experience. So um, um, one of the one of the skills that a counselor does use about learning by counsel is a skill that's called um, sorry a technique that you use, which is called a self disclosure. So there are appropriate times in a counseling relationship that the counselor can self-disclose. Um, maybe certain uh, things that may seem similar to what the client, the counselee has spoken about, um, or something where uh, you know the the counselor found something personally useful. There is a, a provision like that. It's a technique that is that is used in order to help the counselee be motivated towards learning from the counsel that they are receiving. Okay. However, it's not something that we back on. It's not something that you would always do because you're taking off the focus from the experience that uh, taking off the focus for the experience to teach the individual rather than, uh, yeah, for the experience to teach the individual uh, and using counsel to teach the individual. Okay, well, you would do that, but then it it's finally the choice and the determination of the counselee themselves to take, to learn from maybe somebody else's life or to learn from um, uh, their, their experiences. But you give them that kind of a choice. Okay, so um, but I think <clears throat> uh, because as humans, we are so wired that. You, you will never be hit on your head until you experience something, right? Like, like, let's say, think of your own child. You may be asking or you may be teaching your child, you may be telling your child, you know, this is what happened to me, this is what I did, and this is where I went. Your child will be willing to hear, but then unless and until, you know, they go through that same situation, it's when that becomes really consolidated. Okay. And so learning by counsel is helpful. And that's why we have testimonies. And I think testimonies is, is one way that we learn that, okay, you know, this person went through this and this is what they did. Maybe they spoke the scripture, they did this, or they sought that kind of a thing and they learned through that. Right. So yes, it is an, it is an effective thing. And we use it, like I said, in self-disclosure, we use it in counseling, but nevertheless, I think a lot of, as human beings, we need experience. We we are we we live through experiences, and then as a result is what we learn. So, I think that's uh, that's how I'd like to add that. Okay, all right. Okay, good. So, um, um, just uh, sorry, yes, sorry, sir. Go ahead. So, go ahead. So, so you you would still say like the so. Learning by experience is what has to happen, is, is what you're kind of suggesting. In counseling, 
right. you learn a lot by experience you so like for example and and i think some of the principles that we're going to learn will highlight that a little bit in the sense of um let's say uh, let, let's take an example of a person who comes to you with adultery okay and uh, um, yes you you're you're helping them um look at look at what the, this kind of behavior does to them or what kind of fallouts it would have to them you're doing all of that all right so what are you doing you're actually teaching them by counsel that's what you're attempting to do when you're helping them look at the pros and the cons okay mm -hmm. but if they do choose and they say hey you know i still what uh, yeah i know what you're saying is right but then you know i just can't give away my attraction to this person then it becomes learned by experience right because because you are in a place um uh, i think uh, you're not enforcing your counsel you are bringing forth wisdom and helping them as they explore and understand but at the end of it it's the choice that they make so that's what finally gets them to learn by experience and maybe not by counsel so they may shun your counsel uh but they can never shun their experience so i think in from the way that i see it i think a lot of people learn by experience and more than they do by counsel Right. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Okay. All right. Uh, yes. Yes, Christopher, you have a question. We'll just take this last question and get into to class. Yes, Christopher, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So I was just actually while uh, uh, Sam was asking the question, um, uh, I was just thinking through this, uh, and um, uh, I, I, I was not sure whether it was about uh, you know the experience that. Uh, that was uh, that was on uh, you know on the part of the of the counselor or on the uh, on the counselee. Um, so um, the counselee, Christopher, yeah, the counselee. So um, I, I guess this I'm um, just flipping it over uh, uh, on, on on another sort of uh, perspective. Uh, a counselor having the experience of certain. Um, uh, areas, uh, you know, in life where um, they come from having that experience and then, you know, coming out of it and then being able to, uh, you know, provide um, uh, counseling. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, this is the, I, remember, I, I remember there was there was a pastor, I'm not sure, uh, I can't remember who it was, but, you know, he was recounting this, this story about uh, um, uh, I, I guess another pastor who actually went to a a, a person who was a, who was a drunkard, and you know he was just telling him that you know I, I made the statement saying that you know drinking is bad, and um, the, the this person the the, the drunkard uh, came back to the I mean spoke back to the uh, pastor and said uh, uh, you know um, uh, I, I know that I know I know that drinking is bad, and uh, you know you have. Uh, you know theoretical knowledge but i, I have uh, i have the practical experience so in a, in a way he was basically making a point that you know that there are challenges that you know that uh, you know he has a counts i mean the, the drunker has, a, has maybe as a counselor uh, has and uh, in spite of that he's you know he is uh, he's he's doing what he has to do while on the other hand the, the counselor in the case of this pastor um doesn't have that experience and he's you know he's just coming in from a from a more judgmental sort of uh, attitude a knowledge base maybe yeah yes yes so um, and also what comes to mind is you know there are people who have uh, who have gone through those life experiences and um, in a sense reformed um so you know classic cases of you know people who are who have been alcoholics and uh, drug addicts and uh, you know they've been able to you know by the grace of god come out of it and then being able to set up their own centers uh to offer uh, you know uh, counseling and uh, uh you know places where you know they can um, they can address this this particular social issue so um uh, i guess that, that that's the point i i uh, i wanted to make was where the, where the counselor uh, who has the experience may uh, also you know be in a position to 
provide very uh, practical kind of uh, advice, given that given the fact that uh, you know they've actually experienced uh, it themselves. So just thought I'd bring up that point. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher, for bringing that up. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, great. So um, in the next uh, couple of minutes, 30 minutes, uh, we will look into the next part of our uh, class, which is principles. We're going to be um, focusing on principles of, of counseling. Okay. Um, when, we, uh, when, we, when, when we think of the word principles, principles are, I'd say, certain things like certain guidelines that we use to apply when we establish this relationship between the counselor and the counselee. Okay? The, remember that uh, between a counselor and a counselee, the relationship that they share becomes the medium for change. Okay? So what transpires in this relationship between a counselor and counselee how they engage, what they talk, what they say, um, uh, all of that becomes the medium for change and for transformation. Okay, so it is, it is a, this relationship is a dynamic interaction of not just the emotions from the counselee, but even from that of the counsellor. And the specific purpose is to bring about a transformation uh, in the counselee with regard to whatever issues that he's come up with. So the purpose of establishing this relationship is to help um, the counselee to deal with whatever their needs or their problems are. Problems are okay, And this relationship becomes stronger and is strengthened when it is bound by some of these principles and we're going there are seven principles and we're going to be taking each one of them so what i've done is i have um, uh, for each of this i've started off with an example so that we can we can have some kind of an understanding about what these means and so it's just not words big words that we need to swallow okay so we're going to look first of all it's the principle of individualization i will come up to explaining what that is but let's just look at um, at a scenario here okay <clears throat> i'll read this out for you uh, a young couple has just had a newborn baby and they realize that the child is physically challenged the husband being physically challenged himself is quite calm and composed and acceptant of this reality, whereas the wife is troubled and very distressed at the thought of a differentially able child. Okay. Um, what do you, how do you think a counselor should approach this mother? How do you think the counselor should approach this mother? Any thoughts, uh, ideas? The father looks quite OK, well adjusted to the reality, whereas the mother or the wife is very troubled and distressed. So how would a counsellor need to approach this mother? Don't worry, there aren't wrong, right, bad, good answers. We're learning. And uh, so very critical situation here. Such a difficult scenario. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. How, how do you, how, well, you know, what, what would you do to help this mother? Yeah, somebody would like to unmute and quickly, just in 30 seconds, uh, what would you like to do or what would you like to say? Okay, I'm getting some responses. Please repeat the question. I, uh, uh, Anita, I, I asked, how would you approach this mother? What would you do to approach this mother who finds, who's really upset with the 
with the differentially abled child or the child also has a physical challenge right okay so how would you approach so chai says we'll try to understand the mother prabhaka says best is to listen to her rose says uh, i put myself in her shoes by listen i think you said by listening uh, sorry by relating a relating or probing okay try to talk about the reason for her fear and concern okay all right okay all right so you know when we look at a situation like this sometimes what would a what does a medical doctor do and i've seen and this is a real situation and i did see the medical doctor saying telling the wife there's nothing to be concerned about your husband has been physically challenged and he's lived a well and uh, effective life all this long so your child will also pick up is that sensitive do you think that's a sensitive way okay it isn't right so what is what did what has been the expectation the expectation is you know if one person can deal with a situation like this why wouldn't you not deal with it similarly all right so that's generally maybe an expectation from when you're having two people in 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 for counseling one reacts one way the other reacts another way and you you say and and you expect that the individual that may be the mother here or the wife in this case should be um uh, acceptant about about that this reality okay so the principle of individualization uh it, <clears throat> so the principle of individualization so what is it, what, what is the premise the premise is that there are no two people who are alike in all qualities and traits their problems may be the same the cause of the problem may be may be also the same but the perception towards the problem or the strength that they have will differ therefore each person should be treated as a separate entity uh, and um, you know you need to have complete information to establish that close relation with the person so that you can uh, so that you can understand the the root of what they are going through okay so individualization means to work with an individual or analyze an individual not only from a single aspect but from different aspects so remember that every individual is different from others and unique in themselves and the problem of every individual is different from another and it depends upon uh, their intelligence or their statuses or their understanding their own experiences their own physical uh, difficulties and the mode of helping must be in accordance to where you are seeing each person in in their own levels in their situation in their strengths in their capacities in their resources okay so it is based this principle is based that each person has a right to be who they are they are individuals they are unique people and you don't want to mold them into being somebody else or respond in a different way okay the recognition uh, is to understand that they all have each person has their unique qualities some may be uh, more empowering some may not okay but you recognize that they can differ in the way that they uh, they cope like for example the husband has a maybe has a has a coping that is that is much effect much maybe stronger whereas the wife being in a condition like this definitely does not have a good enough uh, resilience or coping in that kind of a situation so that's perfectly okay there is no comparison that one should be like the other so you use methods in order to assist the person to a positive frame of change uh, 
change. And what we are focusing on, they need to be treated as people with differences. And it is OK to be different from one another. So the principle of individualization is based that it based on the premise that the, it is okay it is that they have a right to be who they are the way they experience their life the way that they <clears throat> emote all of that there is a right in who they are so that's called the principle of individualization okay wherein so an extension of this is not comparing that you know th this is not how you should be behaving this is the way that you behave or uh, you should have this kind of a resource to deal with it uh, you should become stronger none of that we, you, they are they are acceptant of the fact that they are individuals um, a, a, as unique as they are in, a, in their individual expressions okay so that's the first one which is the principle of individualization okay the second one uh, as before we go on to the second one i'll, I'll just probably give you certain uh, again, examples so that we, you know, we have a context when we are building these guidelines. Um, two, two case scenarios here. A young wife lost her husband to sudden death. She comes to you and cannot control her tears and her emotions and is incessantly crying. Okay. Or uh, this one, a man is sharing and says, I'm so depressed. I can't work. I can't think. I just sit here all day. Nothing gets done. OK, um, so so how would we respond to people who come uh, to us in situations like this? How would we respond? Uh, Susan, I'm not sure if you responded to this one. It is God's will fulfilled in your life according to the word i don't know if it was in response to that um that maybe you would say uh, you know the loss of your husband is god's will or uh, you're depressed because that's god's will i'm not sure if that's what you intended or it was for the previous one no ma'am it's about the previous uh... or the previous one okay 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 all right yeah okay so what would you if you see in both these examples, there is a lot of emotional expressions, right? Someone is crying. The other one is extremely uh, uh, depressed. OK, yeah. So Chai says, understand her and feelings and her feelings okay, and his feelings. OK, so I'm, I'm going to move in. Otherwise, you know, we, we may not be able to uh, complete. Um, so let me so we're, we're looking at the principle, the next principle. Sorry, the next principle here is the purposeful expression of feelings. So uh, I, I think I want to make a mention over here is that especially in our culture, and I'm speaking on the behalf of Indians um, here, or maybe even South Indians to be more specific, is that expressions of feelings are never in, are generally not very much encouraged. Um, and for all of us who've grown up, you know, maybe as children 10, 30, uh, 30 40 years back, you would have, you know, seen that uh, if you're upset, you get upset in the four corners of your room. You know, you're not allowed an expression of, of your feelings outside, right? So the expression of feelings in even in cultures sometimes can be very stifled okay sometimes are not are seen as a sense of weakness are seen as a sense of a hindrance okay whereas in other cultures you are openly permitted to express your your emotions okay so even an understanding and that's why it's important to know the culture of the person that you are helping to counsel because it gives you a fairly good you know, it, it gives you an understanding if you're read and if you've interacted with people of that kind of a culture, you know how they express their emotions and their feelings. OK, and then you get a context about what could be happening. So what is a purposeful expression of feelings? It is uh, the it is the recognition that the counselee uh, has a need 
to bring about their emotions, their feelings freely, especially those that are negative. Okay, it is a recognition that a counselee needs to express their negative feelings. Okay, and it is uh, it is permitted, it is allowed, and how does the counsellor reciprocate that it is okay to express those feelings is by listening carefully, is by uh, encouraging those expressions is also by stimulating. So what does that mean? You're actually going to throw in words and techniques that will help them to emote even more. All right. Now, for this example that we saw earlier, uh, this example that we saw earlier, like, like you know, uh, a young wife lost her husband and she's, she's crying. Um, how do you stimulate those expression is not by saying, you know, happened has happened. Um, your husband is in a better place. Is with Jesus. He's facing all his joy and happiness there. Shouldn't you be happy? Right? That is throwing guilt. Right? That is throwing a sense of um, uh, question to what they are emoting. Right? But rather, how you would stimulate it is, um, I, I just cannot imagine how pained uh, you are or how much you miss your husband or this loss has probably been very, very um, difficult for you or um, that uh, uh, you, you, your grief is some, something I'm sure you feel nobody can understand. So what, what is it that you're doing is you're actually stimulating this uh, or an, and encouraging this expression of feelings. Because in order for a counselee to be able to come to a place of understanding, they have to be in a place of exploring what they are going through. So a purposeful expression of feelings is something that is important. It, this is a very, very key and important principle in a relationship skill. You, and this is not just for a counsellor and counselee. Even as a counselee, uh, sorry, even as a person who's relating to another, this is a very, very important skill that that you need to develop. OK, so to encourage them to uh, to express their feelings and not withhold it and not keep it within um, uh, Christopher. And I can see that particularly men. Yes, to be able. And the only way that you can get sometimes people, you know, grow up not knowing how to express that they just do not even feel the need. But through the skills of a council. The second principle, which which is um, which is important. OK. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, let me give you an example before we go to the third third principle. So here, you have been called to be a man in the hospital. Before you go in to see him, you find out through talking to the doctor that the man is terminally ill. You go into the room and the man says to you, I want to ask you something. Am I going to die? Do you know? Can you tell me? Am I going to die? Okay, what would your response be? Okay, quickly, if you could put up that example, it'll, I mean, just, just your response, what would it be? No, you're not. <laughs> okay. All right. Answers to this, either yes and a no, right? Okay. All right. So let's look at uh, the the principle. Okay, the principle is called as controlled emotional involvement. Okay, the principle is is uh, called as controlled emotional involvement. Now, just to give you um, an uh, understanding of this is, um, so it it is it's uh, what happens for counselors also is that there can be a tendency for a counselor to be too emotionally involved in the life of their counselees. Okay. 
and that's the principle that it's talking about here is that you are you're not at all you're first of all being sensitive to the counselee's feelings you you're doing your best to approach them with sensitivity but as well as to keep an objective involvement in the problem of the counselee being objective in the way that you involve yourself okay involving in 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 them as a person as well as in their uh, in their problem so if it is you're making an effort to understand what they're going through you feel compassion you feel empathy but you're not in a place where you are jumping in to resolve every one of I'm sorry, I think I, I. Oh. Am I audible? Yes, but now you're audible. Now yeah, audible. okay. Yeah, yeah. so. Okay. So the objective involvement, what we mean here is not, maybe there may, there's not necessary to answer the questions that they may ask you at all points of time, okay? And the idea is to understand where they are emotionally. So for this person, for this example that we were talking about, uh, let me just get back to the example. For the, pers for the example that you're talking about, how being objectively involved is by the news that the doctor has given you about your terminal illness. And I do also sense that there is fear about what you're going through. Do you feel fearful? So what am I doing here is continuing to help them to express what they are going through emotionally rather than giving them maybe an answer for something that I may know or I may not know. Okay, maybe for some things that you are, you do know, you wouldn't prematurely answer a person when there is so much of emotions that are laden in this. Now, when you just speak to this man, you know that there is fear, there is, there is a, <clears throat> a sense of a, a abandonment, there's a sense of frustration. There are so many things over here. And when you actually answer it, you've, you've taken away the opportunity to really help um, uh, deal with the person's emotions that they are going through. So your involvement is something that requires to be, one, objective, it requires to be sensitive, and it requires to be one where you have kept a fair amount of distance in approaching or resolving the person's problem for them. You know, you're not, you don't want to go there and say, okay, I, I will go talk to your spouse if, if he's having an affair with somebody else. No, that's not your job. Your job is to help them to, number one, be, be able to express their emotions and, and Come, bring them to a place of understanding where they are. And your involvement, uh, when it becomes objective, helps the counselee to take on more reins of, of their problem and their issue. Okay? So, so um, a, a controlled emotional involvement is important, especially when you are dealing with people who, who have very strong uh, in strong situations where it can be extremely painful being able to teach yourself on being objective and helping them to process these emotions rather than giving them quick, quick, uh, 
quick fix answers on dealing with those emotions. Okay, so that's that's the um, yeah. Uh, great, Charles. I like that. Your quick answer might kill the man before you share. So sensitivity is paramount. Absolutely. So just being able to help the 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 counselee to understand his fear. What is his, this fear about? Or you know, maybe initially it is just acknowledging. Oh, you seem really afraid. Or you seem uh, uh, as if you're isolated. As if no one can help you. You seem that you can't rely on anyone, isn't it? So it may be initially just that where you are uh, responding to what those feelings and then coming to a place of really exploring where those fears are coming from where that abandonment is coming from and and bringing them slowly to a place of either acceptance or to a place of uh, um, exploring other ways of dealing with their problems so that's what we mean by uh, controlled emotional involvement all right, moving to the next one, I have another four principles. Uh, so I'd like to finish this. So please bear with me for maybe five to 10 minutes. OK, the next one, uh, an example is a young woman comes to talk to you about God and his existence. She feels that she can't break away her allegiance to her God, but yet would also like to treat Jesus as one of the many gods. OK, so that's the example that you have. Um, how would you approach this? Um, how would you approach now? Now, even as we're looking at this entire uh, <clears throat> example, we do we do know um, uh, what the truth is. Okay, but when you are faced with a person who uh, who question, how do you deal with a person like this? Okay. And here, this is where the um, oh, sorry, this is where the uh, principle of self determination comes about. Now, what is self determination? Basically, it means the uh, uh, you're helping the counselee to come to a place to take their own decisions, and you're. You believe that your counselee has the right and the free will to make their own choices and their decisions. So they have a right and they have uh, a need. It's written a need within certain limitations and they have freedom in making their own decisions and choices. Now, what do we mean by uh, certain limitations is they can only make a choice for themselves. They cannot make a choice for others, right? So it is whatever. Uh, right they have in making a choice and and you you hold that as a principle that the that the counselee has the right to make their own decision and their own choice even though it you know or it appears to you that that isn't the right way to go okay so being careful not saying that hey you know you're doing the wrong thing don't come back to me after this saying that you've made a mistake don't tell me that I didn't warn you, like how you talk to your children, right? Don't tell me that I didn't warn you. See, this is what you're up to. Now it's all your business, right? In in counseling, what you're helping the client, the counselee to do is to, um, is uh, you may be opening out different options, but you receive that right that they have uh, uh, whatever decision that they've, they've made, you respect that. And you keep away from direct or indirect interferences, maybe talking to the client's wife and saying, hey, you know, I told him that you also say this and maybe we can get this happening or directly saying, you know, this is the wrong thing to do. This is not, not how it should be. This is the way to follow. Um, all of this is impinging on the free will of the uh, of the individual. So giving them to help what what as a counselor you are doing is to help them see the different aspects of it, the pros and cons of it. But finally, they're the ones who determine and make their own decision. Okay. So that's that's
what exactly needs to be done sorry yeah i think i'm back yeah uh, i think it's uh, the internet is uh, i think it's on my end prabhakar i hope i'm audible to all okay so as Uh, I'm so sorry. I think I'm having significant network issues. Um, I think we, what we can do is probably we'll we'll take this on from next class. Uh, we have just one or two more principles to continue on with because of issues. I'm not able to continue. Um, so can we continue on next? Uh, we will we will take this on from where we stopped. That is the this the principle that we were talking about. I hope that's okay. Um, we will take on the next two principles, the last that we have in our following class. Can we can we quickly just uh, close with a word of prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, for what you are calling each one of us to do. Thank you that this is a responsibility that you desire of us, Lord. That we engage with people who are broken and hurt lord with the same approach that you used father lord even as we understand these principles and elements father we pray god that you would make us more like you compassionate and loving and sensitive and yet lord to be able to speak the truth and love help us lord to whoever we may be dealing with as uh, counselees, that we will entrust them in your hands. And Lord, that you will be their strong wisdom and you will be their strong guide. Thank you for each one of us in the call. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. God bless. We shall continue next week. Apologies for the uh, network issues. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Buster. Thank you. Thank you, Buster.